have the freedom to strive, excel, and make mistakes, are in a position to achieve personal goals, are in a position to affect policy and process decisions that affect their lives, and have the same rights, privileges, responsibilities, and opportunities of citizenship as does any other New Jersey resident. Um, let me now go on to um, explain some of the housekeeping uh, matters. Um, one member of the public who is on the YouTube feed um, is welcome at any time to direct a comment to the council. You can do that through your email, uh, addressing it to njcdd at njcdd.org. That's njcdd at njcdd.org for the YouTube comments. Um, we will respond if we can during the meeting, and if not, I can assure you we will follow up personally with you afterwards if you provide us with your contact information, your email uh, would be uh, best. Uh, we had asked that public comments be submitted in writing by the close of business on Tuesday, May 19th, and um, we only received one that comment will be read and um, right here. For council members, um, if you want to speak, you can use the chat feature in WebEx to indicate that you want to speak or you can raise your hand uh, in the chat box. Um, if you're on the phone, please unmute, indicate that you would like to say something and then wait for the chair to recognize you. Uh, please, nobody just start talking. Uh, there are too many of us on the line for that to be uh, acceptable. So please indicate that you um, want to speak and Jacinta will keep a list uh, so that everybody speaks in the order in which they indicated they wanted to speak. Um, introduce yourself before you do speak. And just one last thing, um, I need to inform everybody that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed and it will be archived. So um, you should realize that anything you say uh, will not just be heard by us, but will be uh, recorded and archived. Uh, I hope that doesn't um, restrict anyone from speaking uh, their mind. Um, at this point, let me just read um, the, one com the one comment that we received. Um, I think it's appropriate for me to indicate that it was submitted by Mike Brill. And Mike is a very distinguished uh, and experienced advocate. Um, he was uh, for several years the chair of the statewide Family Support Planning Council. <clears throat> and he carried out his responsibilities with distinction in that role. He was also uh, the family representative on the, um, the DDD uh, fee for service um, ad advisory uh, committee. So Mike is very knowledgeable, very committed. <clears throat> and here is a statement. DDD's policy at the start of the quarantine was not uniform, but let agencies develop their own standards. In many cases, restricting parents, while at the same time staff came and went on their schedule. Parents who had visited group homes in the past, and in some cases brought food, were told to stay away. With the quarantine lifting, why is there no policy on how to integrate? I'm gonna to have to ask people to mute. Thank you. Uh, the quarantine lifting, why is there no policy on how to reintegrate our population back into the community? Um, I would just also add from my personal experience as a family member and a board member of a provider, the prolonged isolation that our uh, loved ones have experienced has had significant negative impacts on their physical, emotional, and mental health and uh, the well being of residents in licensed facilities. So we really have to think. Uh, while keeping everybody safe, are there ways that we can start to provide some uh, degree of face-to-face -face contact, not physical contact, but um, at a distance? And I'm gonna turn this question or comment over to uh, Jonathan Seaford. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Paul, uh, for the introduction and uh, for the thoughtful question as well. Uh, this is definitely something that we are, uh, 
you know, thinking a lot about over at the division and I think even outside of our disability community, uh, you know, uh, the, the quarantine, the isolation rather, I guess is the good way to, to the better way to put it is taking a toll in a lot of ways. It's an emotional toll for the individual and for the family. And, uh, you know, just really takes a, uh, uh, you know, it, it has a, has an impact on people. So we, uh, you know, do, ha do have a, a residential school policy that we've had up uh, for a while now. We just updated it on May 5th. Uh, because CDC put out some additional symptoms related to COVID-19. So that was the only adjustment to it. Um, the one thing that I would, uh, you know, like to, you know, uh, say is, and point out is the, the curve is flattening, but it's not flat yet. Uh, like we are going in the right direction in terms of hospitalizations and new uh, uh, cases in the state, but we're not at a point where it's down to zero. So I think uh, while it's uh, challenging and uh, creates anxiety, even for me in my personal life, not seeing it, being able to see family members, uh, you know, it's it, it could be very easy to have things go backwards in that direction. So I would ask for people to be patient um, as they have been and continue to, to think in that vein. Um, there are ways around, uh, you know, connecting virtually with individuals. If that's not happening at all, it could happen to a, a better, uh, to, could happen on a different frequency. Um, the other thing to recognize is it's also the other individuals in the home as well. I know it's nobody's thinking about one person, but you know, it's the staff and the other residents of the home that are, you know, looking to be protected from. Um, as it was at the start, visits in terms of like critical medical or behavioral have never been, uh, you know, uh, banned. It's really more, you know, routine kind of visits, uh, sorts of a thing. And we would encourage, uh, you know, uh, uh, in families to contact their agency and, uh, you know, talk about how things can be done. Uh, we had a webinar uh, this morning uh, and I talked about this topic. Uh, and one of the suggestions that I made was, um, you know, talk to, to the agency. We are encouraging uh, uh, residential providers uh, to, uh, you know, get clients out, like parks are reopening. Uh, if they're, you know, uh, take clients out to get some fresh air, go for a walk around the block, go to the park, walk around for, a, you know, a period of time, whatever it would be, making sure that they're keeping in, in context uh, social distancing, the health of the individual, and making sure that the planning team's a part of that, because there could be some families that are not comfortable with, you know, going out at this point in time. Um, and, you know, one suggestion that I had made was if the, the clients are going to a park and Paul before the webinar was saying, even outside of the group home, like if, uh, you know, there could be, you know, kind of a, a social distancing uh, kind of a get together sort of a thing. Uh, to talk with the agency and see how that could be put together. And if an agency is being unreasonable, so please let us know. Uh, contact the division and we can see what we can do. Uh, the one thing that I do think is important uh, to take into account is um, if, uh, you know, if, if the, the team gets together and, you know, the family, you know, part of that, you know, gets together and has a, a suspicion or feels that it could actually be a negative impact on the individual. In other words, it's great to see each other, but if the, not being able to hug somebody, you know, and sit right next to them, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, could actually be a negative experience for the individual and maybe they react in a way that, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that isn't, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, work, working out, uh, that that just be taken into consideration because we don't also want to make this the circumstance more challenging for the individual and the family and the staff and make that interaction one that's uh, not a positive one. So recognizing that things are moving forward, we're, we're uh, you know, learning more about the virus every day as a state and a nation, uh, and that, you know, there, you know, our normal is going to look different moving forward. Uh, we do have to think critically about how we can do this and make sure that we're not negatively impacting individuals and families. Uh, I think it's a struggle, uh, you know, uh, on many levels of that balance between making sure an individual and their, their peers and the staff are safe and the family and balancing all that with uh, the, the, the mental health of everyone involved. So it's a very good question. It deserves, uh, you know, a conversation. And, uh, you know, it's something that we're you know, certainly talking with agencies about, uh, about how we can look at things differently. So thank you.
at this point, I think uh, we've given people time to get on. So I'm going to ask uh, Jacinta to do a roll call. Jacinta? You're muted. Sorry, it takes my computer time to okay. unmute. <laughs> okay, so as Ellie I. Ellie Byra. Uh, okay. Okay, has I joined the meeting. As I can see, just let me know if you're here or not. Obviously, I know Paul is here and Ellie. Uh, what about Walt? Are you here, Walt? I saw Walt before. I'm going to. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Andrew. I'm here. Okay, Tara. She wasn't sure if she was able to make it. Tara told me that she would try to uh, come in for about an hour. She didn't think she could stay for two hours. So I suggested that she come in uh, for the uh, committee reports and Mercedes report. Okay, thank you. Todd Emmons. A second, I have some callers on mute. I think Todd is muted. I'm gonna unmute the callers. Okay, Hello. Todd, are you here? Yes, sir. Thank you. Murder Rosa, are you here? Yeah. Thank you. Gary, I saw you. Uh, Safia, are you here? Kevin Nunes? Thank you. Helen Steinberg. Okay, I'm here, but I'm going to go on you again. Thank you. Dalzell. I'm here. Peg Kinsell. Here. Thank you. Gwen Orlowski. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Thank you. Joyce Jelly. I'm here. Thank you. Phyllis Melendez. Phyllis is present. Thank you. Kim Murray. Here. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline Moskowitz. Thank you. Uh, Karen Carroll, I know, is here. And Jonathan Seafried is here. How about Sarah Aziz? Hi, I'm here. This is Sarah Aziz. Thank you. What about Ryan Roy? Present. Thank you. And Kyle Picone? Uh, yeah. Hi, um, this is uh, Kyle Picone. Thank you. What about Bill Testa? Okay, and uh, Mercedes Witowski. Here. Jody Fox. Here. Thank you, Denny Todd. Present. Thank you, Frank Latham. Here. Thank you, Kyoko Coco. Bob Titus. I am here. Thank you. James Brill. I'm here. Thank you. Gary Brown. Present. Thank you. Rebecca Novinsky. I'm present. Thank you. Uh, Paul Aronson. Hi, I'm here. Thank you. I believe that's all I have. Did I miss something? Um, sorry, I'm muted. I'm going to start with the 
executive committee report and then go to the other reports. And I have to ask people to mute. Okay. Um, I am pleased to report that the executive committee has been active throughout this period. We have been meeting online Here. every two weeks. Um, have uh, focused on advocacy, uh, collaboration with our sister agencies and um, other uh, national and state um, advocacy organizations, as well as maintaining the operations of uh, the agency. Uh, our executive director will elaborate on these things given the time. I'm going to try to be as brief um, as uh, possible. Um, we have uh, run the COVID-19 emergency funding program uh, through the executive committee, and we have been receiving, reviewing, and approving or asking for additional comment on um, letters of intent and applications for the community innovation grants uh, program. Um, the staff has got out the, the annual report this week. Um, the uh, People and Families um, magazine, um, we have um, completed uh, two wonderful um, grant programs uh, from the Box Center and um, I guess what's now Bank Street and Columbia University in uh, collaboration on the oral care. And what's wonderful about that is that uh, there are a whole host of follow on activities uh, that they will engage on and um, that can be engaged and that can be continued uh, within um, New Jersey. Um, we had two wonderful um, oral care summits. We had the support of Jennifer Lang Jacobs, the new director of FEMA, the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services, Medicaid. And at the second one, she had uh, all five of the HMOs and she basically explained to them what the expectations of Medicaid was. And we will uh, be following up um, on that. Uh, the medical research curriculum, um, uh, very, very promising uh, project. And again, for both of those, we have to thank um, Elizabeth and um, the health and wellness uh, subcommittee. Um, I just want to briefly mention some things that are very, very uh, important to me. One is the um, formation of the Legislative Disability Caucus. Um, this was an idea that we picked up from the Ohio Council. This is something that they do in Columbus. And we thought it would be very good to do this in uh, New Jersey. The basic reason is we need legislation to think about the needs of people with disabilities before the legislation is written and passed the way things are currently done in New Jersey. And then we look around and see that there's been no provision for the legislation to pertain to people with um, disabilities. So the hope is that the Legislative Disability Caucus will get that input uh, out to legislators uh, and that consideration of the needs of people with disabilities uh, will be considered before the legislation is written and passed. We have the support of uh, Senate President Sweeney and uh, the majority staff and uh, Libby is working with us and Bob Titus is playing a big role here as is Mercedes, of course. Uh, to get the cooperation and participation of uh, the minority staffs and um, the speaker and the uh, majority staff in the state assembly. Um, second uh, thing um, is emergency planning. We've really learned um, during the COVID crisis the need for emergency planning. We have thousands of individuals who are living in group homes and um, some of them have contacted the virus and some of them have had to go to the hospital. And in many cases, the individual and the families were totally unprepared for this. We ran succession planning um, education days last year in conjunction with the statewide family support planning councils. But I really think we have to include uh, emergency uh, preparedness. There was a wonderful webinar that uh, Jill Hogel uh, for yesterday in terms of the legal paperwork, the advanced medical directives and a temporary um, guardianship for uh, children. I urge everybody to, um, when that is available, and I don't know, I mean, I, I presume uh, it will be available uh, by the beginning of next week online at uh, DRNJ's website, uh, but I really urge everybody to um, 
go into the archive and listen to that webinar. It really was excellent. The three speakers were outstanding. The subject was very, very uh, timely. Uh, I've also asked uh, Helen Steinberg to include um, emergency pre preparedness, emergency planning as part of uh, the next uh, five year state plan. Uh, very, very important. And it's something that people uh, do not think of, but uh, it's something that you have to think about before you need it. So that's a second thing. And I think uh, there will be more um, lessons from the COVID-19 virus. So we'll have to think about that uh, when we do the, uh, the state plan. Um, what have we learned about gaps in the system uh, during the COVID-19? Um, I also want to give special recognition to PEG. Um, the Children and Youth Services Committee has been very, very active uh, throughout um, this emergency as they were before uh, the emergency. And she and Brenda are doing a, a, a terrific job. And I'm very confident that Helen and Brenda will do a, a similarly excellent job um, with the state uh, plan. We already had the first meeting uh, and Helen will elaborate on that. I just wanted to recognize uh, the excellent work that's being done. Um, and it was also mentioned uh, that th there are going to be challenges in reopening and we need to be there to uh, be a partner to um, DDD and um, CSOC uh, as services start to become available to let them know what challenges families are facing and to let families know uh, what will be available and how they access it and also help them with whatever problems uh, they encounter until uh, we're back to something close to uh, normal. I'd also like to put in one more plug. Um, at the MAC meeting, which was done online, uh, Jennifer Langer Jacobs gave an outstanding presentation um, explaining the changes, the waivers, and um, the um, dispensations that were being offered to individuals and their families and their staffs uh, during this emergency. And I would strongly suggest that people should go to the MAC website. I think, you know, you can get it by just going and Googling NJ MAC, N-J-M-A-A-C. The presentation as well as the slides are on uh, the MAC website. Um, no, 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 no. And I Has uh, left the really meeting. urge you to see, uh, you know, what a wonderful job Jennifer um, is doing uh, and um, how much Medicaid is doing to help um, individuals in, during this emergency period. Um, I also want to thank Jonathan Seafried uh, for the outstanding job he and his staff are doing, and especially for the weekly updates. Um, I, I, I said earlier that it was wonderful to see his face. Uh, after two months, but it was also great on a weekly basis and very reassuring um, to hear his voice uh, and letting everybody know that, um, you know, DDD is aware of what's going on, aware of the challenges and families and individuals are facing and is doing their best uh, to modify the system where possible uh, to converse with Washington uh, to try to get waivers where possible, uh, but to do the best that can be done to help uh, our families and, and their providers. So uh, hats off to you, Jonathan. Thank you for everything that you've been doing. Um, and uh, let me turn it over to um, our next uh, speaker, Ellie Byra, uh, the chair of the policy committee. Boris, so Mercedes, can, will you do that? I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, your voice just came in now, Ellie. You want to repeat that? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to read the uh, report that you have done uh, in terms of the kinds of policies you've been working on? Um, I, I don't have the report handy. I can grab it if you'd like, but um, you're more than welcome to read through that, Ellie. Yeah, well, I don't have it either now. <laughs> I'm do sorry. To, um, do you want to uh, just uh, alter the order? Sure, let's do that, and then I'll I'll grab. Uh, Kevin, uh, do you want to do the grants committee report for us? Hello. 
Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Kevin. Hi. How you doing? Um, Thank you. I am Kevin Nunes, the vice chair of the council, also Hi. the Hi. chair of the grants committee. Um, we've been really, really busy the last um, month or so. Well, two months, rather, I should say. Um, the last two months, I should say. Um, like Paul mentioned, we set up an emergency grant fund to help people and families um, cope with this uh, horrific pandemic. The biggest thing we did was we set up this emergency fund to help people and families. What we did was we set up funds for things such as trampolines, such as video game systems, our projects to help our individuals stay engaged throughout the process. And um, the biggest thing we did was we collaborated with the ARC of New Jersey on this project. Um, it was a, a contract modification that was ending. So what we did was we didn't have to create a new contract. We just modified an existing one. So this was a great example of collaboration and advocacy 101 if you've, ever, if you've ever even seen one. As Paul mentioned also, we um, released our annual report that's available publicly now. So you can see how much uh, grant funds we have used in the last year. I won't go over any numbers today specifically just so that we can save time and keep it short as possible for folks. Um, two of our biggest grants ended, which was, of course, as Paul mentioned, our Columbia University grant in collaboration with uh, Bank Street, which was for uh, dental and oral care for our population. That also has a directory of dentists that hopefully serve our population, and um, hopefully you guys will be able to see that, take advantage of it, and their subsequent um, activities afterwards that will be available, hopefully on our website. Once again, the Barriers to Dental Health is available on our website now, as well as our annual report. So, if you want to know the exact numbers, please go to our website there and um, see what we've been up to. Like I said, the executive committee, as Paul mentioned, has been meeting pretty much every two weeks, if not every week, to review these community innovation projects um, along the same line to help our population uh, stay engaged throughout this emergency. We set pr specific parameters and guidelines, so we weren't just giving money away. We had specific um, amounts that we would give out. Examples, uh, $250 per tablet, nothing over $250 for a tablet, $500 for a laptop. So, and there also were a few denials in our community innovation projects. Um, um, again, these were things designed both on a systemic level and a family level to keep our uh, people engaged so they weren't just locked in their rooms doing nothing. Um, this was stuff. One of the biggest things we did was we gave up trampolines um, to, get, to hopefully, again, keep people happy and not bored with the virus. Uh, various art supplies, things like that. Um, this really was, I think, one of the biggest things we've done all year um, was this exact, um, was this product, because it was one of the few times we saw our funds affect families directly, because we usually focus on system change because this is our mandate system change. But with this unique circumstance, we were actually able to see 
families directly benefit from what the council does. And again, if you want any more information, go to our website, and I'll turn it over back over to Paul now, so he can um, uh, with the agenda. Thank you all for your time. Um, Ellie, um, you have yes. uh, the report now. I have it. Okay. Uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19 in March has transformed the advocacy of efforts of DD Council and the IDD community in New Jersey and nationwide. As the pandemic spread, efforts to respond legislatively were largely undertaken by, at the federal level. The National Association of Councils on developmental disabilities and its role as national advocate has been at the table in input and the provision of information. The DD Council attends weekly national virtual meetings to provide comments and questions. Collaboration has intensified substantially of particular importance have been talks and plannings with disability rights, the Bog Center, Division of Developmental Disabilities, the Department of Health, Department of Education, the Department of Children and Families, Children's System of Care, the ARC of New Jersey, the New Jersey Association of Community Providers, the Alliance for the Betterment of Citizens with Disabilities, the Office of Emergency Management, the Mental Health Association, and the Councils for Independent Living. Mercedes and the other staff attend these virtual meetings daily. Commissioner Johnson noted this at the Medical Assistance Advisory Council meeting on April 20th. As reported on the DD Council website shortly after Governor Phil Murphy announced the COVID related closures, the DD Council responded with an innovative and time limited program to help individuals with developmental disabilities remain connected and engaged during social distancing while reducing anxiety. Oops. The Disability Caucus Plan has been developed further by Association Business Solutions. Carla and Libby are DD Council contacts for the project and report positive conversations with Senator Sweeney and Speaker Coughlin. Mercedes and Bob met with Anita, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Q-O-U-E-G-R-A-O-G-O -O -O of the Assembly Majority Office on April 17th, and she expressed support and enthusiasm for the Disability Caucus. The timeline for rollout will depend on the COVID-19 event. The Federal Department of Education delivered a decision favorable to students with disabilities during the COVID crisis in late April, U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos reaffirmed that individual education must take place for all students, including students with disabilities. As a result, the Secretary is not recommending Congress pass any additional waiver authority concerning the free appropriate public education 
and least restrictive environment requirements for the Individuals with Disabilities Act, reiterating that learning must continue for all students. Outreach and advocacy for DSPs has been coordinated by ABS. Kevin Nunes has been a key participant in, for the DD Council. Drafts of the position papers for housing, health care, transportation should be prepared by May 15th, and Mercedes will review them. Progress on state legislation has been delayed by the crisis, including the school safety bill, disability employment, and the council membership. Uh, I think that's about it. No one's been busy doing anything. You can see that. Um, I generally, um thank and congratulate Mercedes for what she accomplishes. Uh, I yeah. waited time to make it to make it self evident to everybody. Uh, so I was waiting for the, um, the policy committee report, but I think you can all see how busy uh, and productive uh, Mercedes has been and how fortunate we are to have her as our executive director. Um, here, and, here. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know where we would have been or how this council would have functioned uh, without her during the first the past two months. Um, no. Let me That's turn right. it over to Helen um, to talk about um, the ongoing activities of the state plan committee. Hi there, am I unmuted? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Um, first of all, uh, I have to say thank you Paul and Mercedes for all the help um, you have been so far. And um, a lot of uh, thanks go to Brenda Considine because um, her uh, company, Considine Communication Strategies, has been extremely busy <laughs> for us. Um, CCS which is what I'll say instead of the whole Considine communications, whatever. Uh, CCS is working with council to facilitate and guide the development of the five-year plan in compliance with the DD Act. Um, and CCS will work to ensure that the plan is developed in compliance with requirements of the DD Act and shall include comprehensive review and analysis, plan goals, assurances, public input and review and consultation with designated state agencies. And um, just going to try to keep the uh, council engaged through all this. There are five phases, uh, February through May, which is pretty much done. <laughs> and um, first part was I to uh, in planning and preparation, where are we now? identify and work with the council state plan committee to guide the process. So uh, chairperson maybe was established, committee members were identified uh, according to bylaws, the committee shall gather data and information for the five-year plan and meeting schedule planned. First meeting has been completed and um, on an email communication with the chair and executive director has, has happened. Um, next is the identifying avenues for collaboration. And DRNJ and UCDD staff invited to serve on the state plan committee. Uh, data and reports requested. Uh, work with council staff and members to review and assess progress on the current five-year plan identifying work that needs to be continued. There were structured interviews with all program staff that has been completed. A comprehensive review, excuse me, of progress on current five-year plan with Mercedes and Paul has been done. Staff perspectives and priorities have been identified through interviews. 
data reports and research requested from all program staff. Structured interviews completed with members of the Council Subcommittee on Children and Youth to review current five-year plan as it relates to education, children's issues, and family support. Um, and uh, review other states' five-year state plans, which have been done, and their planning processes to identify practices or strategies that might be considered in New Jersey. And, um, review other state plans for strategies for public input during the COVID-19 uh, era. <laughs> um, and can, she's continuing the review. Generate a detailed timeline of activities for the development of this five-year plan. Okay, that phase two is uh, March. A lot of these phases overlap each other. So March through August, comprehensive review and analysis data collection and public input um, to find out what is needed. And this is um, ongoing using a variety of channels. And we did have a meeting last week uh, and actually we're going to um, change one thing that was said at that meeting, that the entire committee, planning committee will be involved. Uh, we will not be having any um, smaller group, but um, anyway, using a variety of channels and through a review of qualitative and quantitative data from publicly available resources, uh, describe unmet, un it's, I can't speak today, sorry, describe known unmet needs of individuals with IDD and their families in New Jersey, including unserved and underserved communities. And we discussed it would be the LV LGBTQ communities, non-English speakers, individuals and families in rural areas, and uh, those living in urban areas, individuals experiencing poverty, homelessness, and individuals with dual diagnosis. Um, also going to collect input from the public, key stakeholders, self-advocates, families through a variety of channels, including online, web-based surveys, and up to three public hearings, one of which will take place as part of a council meeting. And um, we've identified some strategies to collect public information made necessary revisions to the plan so that strategies can be implemented through a remote or virtual process should COVID-related distancing steps remain a barrier to traditional public meetings and other forms of in-person data collection. Uh, CCS is working with Gary Brown to develop a plan to get all necessary information about the five-year planning process as well as ways for individuals to provide input onto the um, council website and some have summaries of, uh, of all of this and uh, work with the state planning and uh, council to identify priorities to inform phase three and to guide the development of the plan. Um, phase, I think that was phase two. Phase three is the development of the plan or envisioning the future. And uh, the first part of that has uh, been done, facilitated discussion with council members to develop consensus on a vision for the future. Using a data-driven approach, we will develop a framework for goals and results to be achieved. Review council resources needed to achieve goals and determine goals, objectives, and activities to achieve the desired outcomes. And um, uh, CCS is exploring ways to remotely engage members of the council in envisioning the future. This work has to be carried out through plan, planning retreat, but we are now exploring other ways of collecting information since we don't know if we can do a retreat and um, input from council members in ways that can be carried out safely um, through this you know, social distancing if it continues. 
um, during this phase, phase three, which is May through November, we're going to develop evaluation plan and budget, develop assurances in accordance with the DD Act, section 124, develop logic model, determine activities for plan development. Um, and um, this is being worked on, uh, right? Plan in accordance with ITAC state plan template to address the following areas, state information, state portrait in areas including but not limited to healthcare, employment, information, formal services, interagency agreements, quality assurance, education, early intervention, housing, transportation, childcare, and recreation. Analysis of state issues and challenges, rationale for goals, select evaluation budget assurances, and summary of the process for public review and comment. And um, CCS is taking part in ITEC webinars to ensure compliance with the DD Act. And uh, research and interviews for state portrait are underway. Um, present draft two, which is done, a state planning committee and make changes as needed. Um, by late summer, CCS expects to have the draft plan ready for state planning committee of the council to review and approve and then present to the full council for a vote. Um, present the report for review and approval to release to the public for comment. Um, by late fall of 2020, CCS expects to have the draft plan ready for public review. Fall and winter, we will be carrying out steps to get public input on the draft. November, this year through March, will be public comment period. And um, she'll make, uh, CCS will make the report available to the public for review on the website, on the council website. And uh, using a variety of channels, actively solicit feedback on the draft plan from families, consumers, and other stakeholders. In collaboration with the council staff, work to ensure public comment process is in compliance with state and federal laws. Review the uh, public comments to determine if modifications need to be made to the plan. And um, initiate a second public comment period if needed. Page, uh, page phase five, which is the last phase, will be March through August 15th. The final plan approval uh, will take place and um, be submitted, etc. cetera. Um, there, there are many different um, agencies groups for partnership that we would hope to be able to um, connect with. And uh, we're looking at like CILS, uh, so people first, self-advocacy groups, youth leadership groups, ARCs, County Office on Human Services and Disabilities, uh, PIP graduates, NAMI, and DVRS. And, um, you know, families and Riders and staff, etc. Um, to go through it for the LB, LGBTQ self advocates, uh, the agencies or group partners with the ARC of Mercer, Pride Group, ITOPS, New Jersey Lesbian and Gay Coalition, Proud Family Health Somerset County. Um, and there's various different ways. We did talk about uh, whether the council is able to translate to different languages and that um, what needs to be done for that to happen has, has happened. They will be able to translate into various languages and the uh, languages that we're concerned with, if I can find it here. Or, um, okay, here we go. Um, we have underserved populations would be Spanish, Chinese, Portuguese, Korean, Creole, Haitian, 
and cultural groups, the Orthodox Jewish communities and the LGBTQ youth and families. Again, the, the urban and, and suburban groups and uh, those with the possibly dual diagnoses, mental illness and or addiction, and the uh, homeless, those living in poverty, as I um, said before. Um, we're going to be having planning, or we're hoping to have plan, state planning meetings once a month, uh, the full planning committee. And um, Brenda will be giving a report, a complete report at the end of each month. So uh, that's it. Okay, thank you, Helen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, executive director uh, for her report. Thank you, Paul. Um, Jay, if you could advance a slide, that'd be great. So um, thank you all for joining us uh, in this remote way today. Uh, I'm sure that um, if you had an opportunity to make it down to the Hilton Garden Inns, and we had that opportunity to be there that um, we would have would get to see you all face to face, but this is the next best thing. Um, and I, I'll just say that I do miss our uh, evening before caucus meetings. So to our self advocates on our council, um, we do uh, miss that opportunity. And that's one that we can't replace um, with this online um, uh, time. So I've heard the term unprecedented times uh, more uh, and over and over again, and the meaning has really um, uh, g given us pause to recognize all that we've been through in the last nine weeks. As New Jersey began to experience COVID-19, we had many challenges to consider with the most serious focus on keeping people healthy, safe, and out of harm's way. Unfortunately, uh, many of us have experienced uh, some level of loss within our families, within our communities, and NJCDD is no exception to that. We've lost several longtime advocates um, during COVID, and we um, just want to um, make sure we take this opportunity to hold them uh, near and dear to us um, to reflect on um, the a loss is sad, but to also uh, remember that we need to celebrate uh, the lives of people that have brought us to where we are today as a community um, is also important. Um, I think that um, our state leaders have recognized the important steps that had to be taken to minimize impact, um, especially given the more serious impact on people with disabilities, and we're grateful for that. Um, uh, the other thing that I just wanted to say right at the at the top was that um, if there were ever a time that we were to be recognizing direct support professional, the time is now. Um, they are really the backbone of our system um, after the devoted families across our state. So if you're a DSP or if you know a DSP, DSP please send our appreciation and thanks on behalf of the council um, for the work that they're doing to keep um, people um, as engaged as possible during this time. So I'm going to cover um, COVID-19 activities central to the council's implementation strategies of making it happen through advocacy, collaboration, and education. Um, and so if Jay, if you can go to the next slide um, and I'll just kind of step, set the stage for this. Um, the first thing that we had to do very quickly back in March, uh, what, like most other businesses, was to develop a telework plan um, because um, we needed to get out of our downtown uh, Trenton offices where our staff would, were reporting every day and look at ways that we can continue to um, meet our objectives, um, uh, address how meetings and events and projects we're going to take place and make those plans. So that was a very quick turnaround and it seems like years ago, but it was only 9 weeks ago that we were doing that. Um, then we needed to deploy uh, a monitoring system for our telework plan um, where we were um, developed staff tracking tools uh, daily uh, on a daily basis. Our NJCDD team of staff 
check in and report on the events that um, have occurred and what things we need to be focused on. And that's the way that we've really been and been able to remain engaged with uh, our collaborators, with our stakeholders, with individuals uh, with disabilities, with families of individuals with disabilities. Um, and we needed to, we, we didn't have a platform even like this, uh, a WebEx platform. So we investigated what was out there and we thought that this was going to be the most effective for our needs. Today's the first day that we're holding a council meeting this way. I venture to say as much as we'd like to get back together, it might be the way we will proceed in some form for many meetings and potentially even council meetings. Um, and we're curious to see how our linking this to a, U, a live YouTube video will work in keeping our public engaged as well. Um, so through the process, we've connected um, again, as I said, with self advocates, with families, with stakeholders to really remain engaged and in, in, in touch with um, these times and what people are experiencing. And it, you know, that's just not enough because at the same time, we're also looking at the ways that we have to monitor changes. Things are happening every day. Changes are taking place every day. And this, this, this landscape is certainly causing us and, and pushing us to ensure that we continue to keep a pulse on what people are experiencing. Um, next slide. So I'll go through the three ways in which we make it happen. And that's, those are um, advocate, collaborate, and educate. Um, up on your slide right now, you um, for those of you who can't see, I will read off some of this. Um, we've advocated in multi multiple, uh, at multiple levels in multiple ways. And um, two uh, important to the health of individuals have been in um, a policy that the state Department of Health um, distributed on the allocation of critical care resources. Um, we did that in partnership with the DD Act partners, the Council of Disability Rights New Jersey and the Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities and the Got a little bit. I don't know if somebody wants to mark themselves. Um, and um, our ombudsman. Um, we had an interesting um, mix here because it wasn't just uh, at, at this policy that disability issues were at the forefront, but also um, we were able to have conversations with AARP, with the long term care ombudsman, Lori Brewer, with others, including. Um, the Deputy Chief of Staff, Deborah Cornavaca, and the Department of Health Commissioner, Judy Persicelli. Um, we were able to address um, conversations around the allocation of critical re care resources and perhaps the um, discrimination or the ways in which people with disabilities would may not be treated um, appropriately um, if, if critical care resources were limited um, during the increase of patients hospitalized with COVID. Um, that, um, that advocacy also spilled over into what the council took on front and center around hospital visitation and the need for um, uh, the hospital visitation policy to allow for visitors when people with disabilities um, had those needs uh, for a parent, a caregiver, uh, a, a paid staff to be present. So we launched a, a while uh, a wide advocacy campaign uh, in early April, and just a few weeks later, um, the state Department of Health issued um, its first hospital visitation policy, which is on our website and many others. And an update um, came out just recently last week. So we encourage you to take a look at that. And make sure you. Um, continue to ask questions and weigh in on that advocacy. The other thing we needed to advocate for was um, we have a lot of acronyms in our in our field. And so we have PPP and we have PPL and then we got PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and um, we, we, out, we advocated for that at both the provider level and the home uh, level where uh, workers are still and are still continuing to come into the homes of people with disabilities. We're also able to advocate um, with connections through the county offices of emergency management who were uh, compiling lists of 
businesses, uh, um, health centers that were in need of personal protective equipment. And we we're able to also make some connection with a local church who um, has donated 40,000 washable masks and has been distributing them throughout our community. Um, advocacy around testing. Um, and now that we see the uh, expansion of testing is a positive thing that many families, many individuals had concern about. So uh, testing was an, definitely an area of advocacy. Uh, on the adult service side, um, we have um, advocated for a long time now for policies um, that would allow parents, spouse, and guardians to be workers for their loved ones. And um, we were very pleased to see early on that the Division of Developmental Disabilities relaxed the requirements um, and allowed for parents, spouse, and guardians as workers. Um, we will continue to advocate that that be a policy moving forward as well. Um, we also listened to feedback that families had around the adult service system, like um, day programs. Um, it was very hard to hear when, it, when day programs closed. Um, but protection and, and health and safety of our children was the first priority. Um, and now there's conversation and advocacy around how will day programs reopen? Um, how will people remain safe in, uh, in, in um, situations that involve um, more congregate settings like a day program? Uh, policies um, from residential providers around their practices for safety and um, family visits, um, as, as we heard at the top of the hour, uh, regarding uh, the first public po comment question. We've also um, advocated around special education and early intervention services and access to um, those services uh, for uh, our, our younger children with disabilities. And in our children's system of care, We've also advocated um, and had, had early conversations with Molly Green, the assistant uh, commissioner at the Children's System of Care. And next Thursday, a week from today, uh, there will be a town hall with the DDAC partners and ombudsman with Molly Green. Um, so I would encourage anyone to share or register for that. Um, next slide, please. So the advocacy, is, as Ellie mentioned in her report at the national level, um, I do participate in weekly calls with the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, and Bob and I have participated in their public policy meetings as well. Um, the, the National Council is a, um, a, a wonderful way in which I'm able to um, not just share what, what's happening here in New Jersey, but to gather other critical information and understanding um, the federal uh, impacts and measures taken um, and, and impact in our state and across other states. Um, the one thing that the National Association did was we got together and we um, formulated four top priorities for our national associations to focus on and put in um, recommendations for some enhanced funding to states which um, it looks like now we have about $10 million that we're waiting to see how it will be allocated. But the four areas I'll briefly describe, one was on bridging the digital divide or the technical technical divide. We see um, way too many people who have not been able to access um, technology in order to remain connected. The second was on, a, on per being able to look at assistance that caregivers need, both paid and unpaid, and specifically around the areas of PPE. We were very unprepared for that um, across the country. Uh, the third is looking at emergency communications and how much communication that's out there is not in plain language. It's not easily available for people with disabilities to understand or their families, and um, not being available in multiple languages has also become um, a national concern. And the fourth concern, and these were really not in any particular order, was um, looking at how to address the gaps in emergency planning now that we've uh, been through this pandemic and how can we as councils across our country and the, and the territories look at ways to address those gaps in what we've learned as a result of COVID. Um, back at the state level, 
Um, we have been engaged in conversations around how the state of New Jersey has applied for Medicaid waivers, um, the approval of the 1135K waiver initially, and hopefully soon approval of another waiver that has allowed for flexibilities in the way Medicaid services are being delivered and also relaxes some of the requirements in order to best meet, meet the needs of folks. So we've been contributing to what those needs are and asking the state to include in its waiver applications ways in which services can be delivered most effectively. NJ Gained um, is another group that the council has participated. Um, Denny on our, in our office has participated for many, uh, many years. Um, and this is a, a, a called the Group for Access and Integration of Needs in Emergencies and Disasters. And it acts as an advisory board to the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management and the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness regarding issues affecting people with access and functional needs. Um, before, during, and after a crisis. And uh, if you, this group used to meet monthly, they now meet weekly. And you hear over and over again on these calls that um, most of what this group has dealt with in the past have been in Superstorm Sandy, for example, and other, or other natural disasters that have caused, you know, uh, intense, quick uh, reaction. And um, in this case, this is very prolonged and very different than what the NJ Gain Group has, has had to um, work on in the past. Um, the um, way in which we have, I believe, helped and assisted um, is in providing information and linking the county offices of emergency management to those PPE needs across our state. And also, um, uh, Gary has been participating with a few of the county offices of emergency management where we could drive donations specifically to counties uh, for distribution, um, not uh, globally, but specific to providers of individuals uh, with disabilities. Um, kind of off the beaten path of COVID um, is, uh, and it's nice to participate in things that are not predominantly COVID uh, focused has been um, the advocacy that we've been um, participating in around electronic visit verification or another acronym EVV. Um, all states are required to document provider in home visits through electronic visit verification. And um, while New Jersey has not yet selected a vendor to implement EVV, it is gearing up. Um, Jen Jacobs, our state Medicaid director, explained EVV to families last fall at a family support planning council meeting and agreed to meet with families who expressed concerns about electronic visit verification. Um, we had coordinated that meeting just at the break of, um, of COVID in our state, but um, thank thankfully we were able to conduct a virtual meeting on April 24th and we provided input um, to the uh, EVV process for those in-home visits. Um, specifically, we advocated for the flexibility for live-in caregivers um, to be exempt from electronic visit verification and to look at um, the uh, making sure that the EVV system would not be harmful or too restrictive for the appropriate delivery of community-based services um, and that it would consider those um, the ways in which it could hamper uh, community-based activities. Um, we also have, uh, you know, deep concerns about how EVV may impact worker wages. And we all know that workers um, are direct professionals. Many live paycheck to paycheck. And we can't allow a system that uh, electronic visit verification might create where a worker doesn't receive their full wages based on a missed ver verification. Um, or some way that would somehow lessen their, their pay. Um, it's hard enough uh, at, at the wages folks are paid and um, we need to make sure that EVV does not create yet another barrier. Next slide, please. So collaboration, um, at a time when social distancing is the norm, um, we've also had to figure out how to dramatically increase our collaborative efforts. Um, and I think collaboration has really taken on a whole new meaning 
when it comes to COVID. Um, I find myself um, talking about how resilient our community is. I often, you know, will say to people uh, um, and friends that don't have disability in their lives, where they complain a lot, they are um, um, as concerned as any, but they seem to complain a lot more. I, I, I think that people with disabilities, families of individuals with disabilities, face far more challenge on a day-to-day -day basis and have have really been flexible um, we've, we've figured out how to get together, how to make um, uh, and continue to um, have our needs um, uh, met. And um, I think that that is, um, has a lot to do with the way that we live and operate every day of our lives. So as far as con collaboration goes, we've absolutely kicked it up um, to high levels. Um, we've solidified many of the collaborative ways in which we come together and have deepened those collaborations. And that would be true with our DD Act partners that are, we already work together. Uh, Gwen Orlowski, uh, Deborah Spitalnik, and I regularly met before COVID. And I would say that we have more than weekly communications now. We meet, we do meet weekly on a phone call, an official phone call. Um, and we have included our ombudsman uh, and, and his staff in those discussions because of how important it is for us to stay um, engaged, to keep a pulse on things, to um, share what we learn, because what we learn from one um, conversation very often is happening across our system. So um, I really appreciate those opportunities. Um, and with our DD Act uh, partners and ombudsman, we've been able to set up a series of town halls which were really intended to be listening sessions, to have people um, participate in a way where we could hear what they were experiencing and make sure that we brought resources together. And I'll, I'll just touch on that a little bit in a few minutes as well. Um, we've also collaborated um, and um, really I've, I've looked to, the, to SPAN um, and thank you, PAG, for um, being, you know, always having information available for us to make sure that our parents of, of uh, children in uh, special education have the information that they need. Um, we are, we also participate in, uh, I participate in calls with the ARC of New Jersey, with the New Jersey Association of Community Providers and the Alliance for Betterment of Citizens with Disabilities on a frequent basis um, to, uh, again, uh, bring information to each other and figure out ways that we can approach advocacy collectively. Um, I'm very pleased with additional um, communication that we've had for, with the Centers for Independent Living, and I see that being another area the, of, of further collaboration as well as Autism New Jersey. And I'm sorry if I've left any out, but uh, the last nine weeks have been pretty intense. Um, and I went through at least two notebooks of, of of notes to make sure that I could bring you the most current information today. So uh, we're in sync. Um, I was a band my daughter used to like. I don't even know if they do much anymore, but we're in sync. Uh, we must say that. Uh, next slide, please, Jay. Uh, and then there's the collabor collaboration, and I could have gone in either order with this, um, but the collaboration with the state partners and state agencies has really also um, uh, as they, as I think Emeril Lagasse used to say, kick it up a notch. Um, we definitely have kicked it up um, as well. Um, we um, are very pleased with a newly formed disability action committee that Deborah Konovaka and Paul Aronson have been instrumental in, in seeing come to light, um, which is gearing up some amazing advocates across our state to focus on immediate short-term and long-term recommendations. Um, I, I must say the only disappointing part of this disability action committee is that um, until we make disability part of every discussion, we'll always have to be working harder from the sidelines um, to keep disability issues on the table. So um, we'll do that. Um, we'll continue to do that. But I'd love to see the day where disability is part of the fabric of every conversation and not an add on after policies have been written and decisions have been made. Um, we also have um, 
Um, I've had opportunity to work in collaboration with our commissioner, Carol Johnson, at the Department of Human Services, with Sarah Edelman, our deputy commissioner. Um, value and appreciate the work that uh, um, uh, and relationship that we have with John Seafried, um, who's on our council, um, with Perry Neron, who is at the division, uh, heading up the Division of Disability Services, and of course, Jen Jacobs at the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services. We've all been working and it's evident that that team of state partners have been working around the clock in this uncharted territory to make sure that they're doing all that they can to keep people safe and giving families and individuals the access to the resources that they need. Um, Department of Health um, collaborations have taken place, as I mentioned earlier, our Department of Children and Families and um, Department of Ed as well. Um, next slide. So we, um, early on at COVID, we, we knew that we wanted to um, have our council website be a place where people could go if they needed information. And um, we were able to uh, launch a pop-up on our website with links that we filtered that we hope provide people the information that they need when they, uh, that they have access when they need it. We also, since March 16th, we've pushed out 53 discrete communications to our email subscribers and social media followers uh, with firsthand information on what per people are looking for. And we hope that they're, we're delivering that in a way that's been useful. Um, the DD Act partners, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, has has hosted now three town halls um, with our ombudsman, Paul Aronson. The first three um, that were completed, um, the first one focusing on a general opening town hall, and then um, we were fortunate to have John Seafried join our second town hall. Uh, and our third town hall was with representatives uh, Kim Buxenbaum and Dominic Rota at the Department of Education, which also was um, well attended and all three have been recorded and are available on our websites um, if you'd like to go back. Um, I think I'm getting close to time, but let me, um, uh, let me just wrap up if you could, um, Jay, go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information on our uh, emergency special funding response um, that we put out on March 26th. Um, we, we knew that even though we had lots going on at the council that that really wasn't enough and we wanted to make sure that early on we were able to um, address the needs of folks that really have, were having a lot more challenge with um, the social distancing measures and the isolation. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that the council moved forward uh, through the executive committee in releasing an emergency funding opportunity for uh, individuals with disabilities, for families of individuals with disabilities and for qualified providers uh, supporting those individuals. The focus of the emergency funding was to promote health and alleviate anxiety and we did that in a way where we were allowing people to submit applications where they could access activities and items to maintain their health and connect them with families and friends. And I do have um, a little bit of a uh, more of a report on that than Kevin was able to share earlier. Um, uh, so next slide, Jay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that when I, we approach the Arc of New Jersey uh, in a contract that we had with them, you know, Tom Bafuda was immediately, you know, all on board. Uh, and then uh, I guess he, uh, the Arc and their staff who had were helped to, helping to manage this really didn't know what they were in for because we had 686 applications that were processed to support over 3,000 individuals um, within uh, the two and a half week notice period. Um, and that did close on April 15th. So there were 587 applications that were approved ultimately to support over uh, 2,300 people. Approximately $250,000 of funding was awarded. Um, the ARC of New Jersey processed 175,000 of that and NJCDD processed funding to some of the larger agencies that, um, that had, had been approved at a, for about 75,000. Um, even though the grant ranges for it, each individual was $250 to $500, the average individual grant amount was just about $250. Um, most commonly funded were items that included electronic devices, and no, to no surprise, 
um, uh, sensory items, trampolines, um, a big item, ticket item for, for many people and other outdoor equipment that I'm, I'm sure people are really now enjoying that the weather has turned for us into, into better, better days, um, exercise equipment and music and art supplies. So at this point, um, with the funding um, being distributed, we're now able to um, ask and begin to collect outcome reporting uh, for each of the fundi funded applications on how people are remaining healthy, how people have experienced decreases in anxiety and remain connected with their family and friends, and some new routines using um, the, the, the funds that had been awarded and the items that they had purchased as a result. Um, so as we get those stories back, we will share them with you. Um, we got some very early pictures of very big smiling faces um, uh, sitting on, on play outside play areas and uh, holding electronic devices in their hands. So um, the first visual effects were, were very positive and we are confident that the, the written reports that will come in now will mirror those, um, those smiling faces. Um, Paul, I'm just going to take two more minutes. Is that okay? Uh, try to try to keep it to two. Two. I'm going to do it. Two. Last slide, um, and then I'll I'll just let you mostly mostly look at this. Um, uh, and a lot of this has already also been reported in some of the earlier reports. Um, our uh, addressing barriers to oral health report was out this week. We will have another report out. Um, from the two contracts that were wrapping up last um, last month, last no nope, end of March actually, um, we did and uh, release our annual report. Um, we also have um, people and families coming out this week. Um, our council staff have, you know, in this telework environment, remained connected with our people first groups, uh, engaged with how we're going to kick up. Uh, and, and re-enter the schools next year with our youth leadership groups, um, our public policy uh, work with new uh, position papers are being drafted. I wanna thank um, Jay for uh, setting up and learning all of this remote accessing uh, that we're, we're engaged in. I wanna thank Jody for the contracts and all the modifications that we've needed to do um, to make sure that the council continues to operate meeting our current five-year goals and objectives and moving forward into what our next five years are, is going to shape up to be. So um, um, I'll, I'll wrap up there, Paul, because I said two minutes and, uh, and I know you meant it, but uh, thank you all and uh, thank you all for the work that you're doing and looking forward to hearing um, your reports. Mercedes. Um... Next item on the agenda is an opportunity for council members to comment on anything that they believe is worth passing along that they've either experienced, uh, witnessed, or thought of um, during the, uh, the pandemic. Um, we obviously have not had a chance to really get together, so we thought we would give people an opportunity to, and I say this strictly, very, very briefly uh, to make any comments that you would like uh, and, and, and think that other people would benefit from hearing. Um, uh, I, I guess we can just ask people if you um, want to, uh, you know, indicate in the chat box or uh, I, I guess those people who are showing their, their pictures uh, can, you know, raise their hand, but we'll try to do it electronically so that uh, Jacinta can can recognize people in the order in which uh, they respond. I see Kevin Nunez has his hand up. Uh, I'm seeing Gwen Orlowski also. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, who do you want to go first, Kevin or Gwen? Uh, you said Kevin, so do Kevin and then Gwen. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry, or so. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to thank everyone that uh, for all that we've done together over the last two months. Uh, this is, has truly been a good example 
of education, collaboration, and, advo and advocacy all in one. It's kind of uh, kind of shown how strong the council can be. On a personal note, um, I did publish an op-ed on the DSP living wage issue a few weeks back, and um, hopefully you got to see that. But if you didn't, um, that's like available online now with the Berlin County Times. Um, there's also, um, and StarTech is having a national advocate call twice weekly, Mondays and Thursdays at one o'clock. So if you're interested in, in that, call the council offices or con contact them. It is for advocates um, to just basically learn and grow together through this new normal, quote unquote. So um, once again, that is StarTech. It's twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays at one o'clock. Um, we basically just pick one disability issue and talk about it for an hour. Um, and finally, if you want to follow my blog, it's advocate Kevin Nunes at WordPress.com. Um, thank you all once again. Please stay safe, and I wish you all the best. Um, so hi, everybody. First of all, I, I echo a lot of what Kevin said and really just wanted um, to thank the council and Mercedes in particular um, about all that collaborative work um, that we've been able to do with one another since um, mid-March, um, which has, uh, you know, I think we'll look back on this time as uh, some of the most um, professionally difficult uh, months of our careers, um, but in many ways also um, the most rewarding for the relationships we've formed and for um, some of the really outstanding advocacy I think we've been able to do together. So thank you for that. Um, and then I would just say, you know, my mind over the last week or so is starting to turn to um, what comes next. Um, how do we start to prepare now for the next year um, so that we don't get caught off guard again, so that we um, don't find ourselves, you know, one day or one week doing work our typical way and the next week the whole world has changed. And so thinking about those plans are um, and putting in place, formalizing some of the thoughts and work and methods that we've come up with in the last two months so that to help us get us through the next year, um, if they are correct, that you know we're going to see second, a uh, second, and maybe a third wave of this. And um, I'm sure we'll continue at DRNJ to be working collaboratively with the council um, on that in the coming year. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Gwen. I, I would just um, hope that people recognize. The range of issues that have been addressed uh, by the council and the council staff, the range of collaborations uh, have solidified uh, and strengthened. Uh, just uh, organizations I give special thanks to. Um, Disability Rights uh, has been just a wonderful partner uh, for a very long time, but they've done a terrific uh, coming up with some wonderful. Um, and um, I would suggest that people go to their website uh, and go through the archives. They've had some really, really terrific one. I mentioned the one uh, yesterday, which was really uh, first rate and very timely. And they address the issues um, in clear, concise, understandable uh, language. And um, you know that that's not always to uh, lay people like, such as ourselves. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Box Center both for their collaboration with us and for the wonderful programs uh, that they have run, the DD Lecture Series, and um, a collaboration that they're doing with um, DD and uh, the Council, um, which we've, we've, which is just, that, uh, I don't know, maybe um, I could ask Rebecca to comment on that because she, and uh, or or Kyoko because they've both been uh, very much involved uh, in that. So um, 
and just bef before I do that, before I turn it over to either Kyoko or Rebecca, um, I would uh, um, just um, like to uh, give credit to the Ark of New Jersey. They have also run uh, a lot of wonderful um, webinars, and you should go on their website, get their calendar and their archives. Where since I don't have all that much time, I, I'll just mention one that they did yesterday, uh, which was um, the Partners in Justice. They had a wonderful uh, speaker. Uh, she was from Manchester in England, but uh, she had a very strong Scottish um, accent, delightful um, accent, but I have rarely encountered someone as knowledgeable on a subject as she was, and she was basically speaking about uh, autism and then um, the uh, complications that people with severe autism have sometimes had uh, in the legal uh, area where they do, do their misconstruing uh, social signs that people send out to them and people misunderstanding their view of things differently than they do. And finally, one last one. Uh, the American uh, Academy of Disability Medicine and Dentistry, which was very much involved in cooperating with uh, our national association uh, on the, uh, the hospital visitation issue and other medical um, issues. This gives uh, our national association um, basically a partner uh, of medical practitioners so that we get the expertise uh, of physicians um, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, uh, and they also uh, put out some wonderful um, webinars. Um, so let, let me ask Kyoko or um, Rebecca if they want to ad address uh, the life course uh, project. Uh, hi, this is Rebecca. I'll go first and Kyoko, please um, feel free to jump in if I miss anyone. You can hear me, right, Paul? Awesome. Gotta check, gotta check. Um, so uh, New Jersey has joined um, with 19 states um, as a member of a national community of practice uh, for a framework for thinking about the lives of in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, which is charting the life course. Um, it's using some tools, but it's just, it's more a framework for how we think about um, expectations, hopes and dreams of our loved ones um, and the trajectory for their life course. Um, so that's a very quick way of, of describing a very complicated thing, but Kyoko and I have had opportunities where to work with people throughout um, the nation um, on various different virtual platforms. And we've been collaborating closely with Trish Brennan at Division of Developmental Disabilities and Colleen McLaughlin at the Boggs Center to bring these tools to New Jersey in a planful way uh, using the regional family support planning councils and other partners such as SPAN, um, and uh, our def def definitely uh, Department of Ed, Department of Health will be involved um, as well as Children's System of Care. Um, but the regional councils are really a good place to disseminate this through. It seems like a natural partner because um, it's all about collaborating with families and using the family voice and the, indi and the individual, of course, themselves, their voice is important as well. Um, so the tools are available for free for anyone that wants them um, at lifecoursetools.com, I believe. Um, if anybody wants to follow up with me to find out more about this, the more the merrier. Uh, we wanna spread this through New Jersey. We were going to do it in a planful regional way I'm not sure that makes sense. We're reevaluating. We're doing sort of more statewide um, introductions at this point. We uh, did a webinar and it will also be addressed um, at our open public meeting, which will be June 13th, our statewide meeting that used to be also in person in Hamilton. So now you just need to log on to WebEx to join us then. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. It's something I'm very excited about. Thank you, Rebecca. Did you want to add anything, Kyoko? Um, okay. Um, is Kyoko with us? She is. Kyoko. 
Don't be bashful. She's playing with her mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she also went for uh, the training, the multi-state training uh, in, the, in, in the project. But um, I, I found it very, very useful. It forces you to think about all the resources that are available as opposed to thinking about your child's disabilities. Um, and if you're going to give your child a better life, you really have to think about what resources are out there rather than uh, just focusing on disabilities. Right, and not just disability resources, but resources yes. for all, and the community as the all is a big part of it. Yeah, because if you want your child to uh, enjoy things that people without disabilities enjoy, you have to look at resources that are available and accessed by people who don't have disabilities. Um, on a trajectory for that community. No, I just quickly uh, would like to add that, you know, while working with other states, you know, some states are struggling to identify family leadership in the state. So uh, we are. Hello. We can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, Kiyoko, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Maybe yes. not. Yes, you can't hear us, but we can hear you. Oh, no, she just muted. Um, okay, she couldn't hear us. Yeah. Um, um, I, I was very pleased at the in person meeting we had before, um, the, uh, the emergency, we had a very good turnout from, uh, the regional, uh, councils. Um, I can proudly say, especially council 5, which had the most, uh, members as we, as we usually do, but I, I, I think it was a very, because they meet in your region, Paul, just saying. I know, I know, but I never say that. <laughs> I always find it unnecessary to say that. Yeah, that that I that. Always that have to point me. that out. Sorry. Uh, but I I think we all felt it was a very worthwhile uh, project, and I think Re Rebecca and uh, Colleen uh, from uh, the Box Center just did a, a wonderful job uh, in introducing the concept uh, to those of us who had not really been exposed uh, to it. Uh, before, um, so I think what Kiyoko was trying to say is we're lucky in this state that we have the structure of the family leadership because it, she's seeing in other states. Oh, um, you know what? People are struggling. I think uh, I could hear myself like twenty seconds later. Um, I apologize. Oh, you're fine now. Uh, we could hear you fine, Kiyoko. We hear you fine. So go ahead if you want to add anything. You're muted again. I get that she seems to be having a problem hearing us. Right. Um, okay. Um, but anyway, we also want to thank um, DHS and DDD uh, for giving us the opportunity to participate uh, in this program and uh, working along with us. Uh, Trish Brennan um, has been uh, the lead person for um, DDD, and um, we will, uh, you know, continue to use this and to try to bring it to more and more uh, of our families because it really does change your perspective in a very positive uh, way. Um, we are um, ahead of schedule. Um, I, let me check with um, Jacinta. We have any other uh, folks who want to um, speak? Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who is that? Oh, go ahead. I, I has anybody else raised their hands? I have not seen anyone else raising their hand. Is that someone yeah. else? Rebecca did a pretty good job to summarize it. Okay. Um, I, so I, I want to thank everybody for As, um, participating. Um, I hope Someone you got is raising their hand over there. Walt Fernandez would like to speak. Oh, great. Walt is running. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. A question about day programs. Um, 
I had a friend tell me they live on the, the west side of the state that their child is not going to their day program and the day program is not um, giving them anything to work with at home. And the day program is charging um, their budget full boat for the past two months since this has started. Um, and then I heard of um, other programs that aren't charging full amount and the family support coordinator reached out to those families and they're able to spend those dollars that are not spent on the day programs on other things directly. Do we have any information on that? And what is the, you know, can something be sent out or what is the overall um, way people should be dealing with, you know, the expense of their day programs and the lack of the spending and the availability of using those funds on something else? Sure, sure. This is John Seafried. I'll take that one if you don't mind. Um, well, we have provided guidance that your support coordinator uh, would hopefully have the information. Uh, we have put out guidance. It's on our website. But um, uh, first off, if a agencies are only claiming for services if a person attends, so they're not attending the service, so they they should not be claiming for. It. If there is, that's an issue. We're paying uh, some retainer funds to you know to maintain the uh, the day service integrity for when things get open, but they're not charging the budget. If an individual needs funds to free up to purchase services because they are home, the support coordinator can do an adjustment to the plan and uh, basically revise it to, to unallocate those dollars. Uh, and then that would free up money to spend on other areas. Um, the one thing to be careful of uh, and just be mindful of, and uh, we've talked about this before and are sending out another communication today to support coordinators, and I did talk about it on today's webinar, is that when uh, you know, purchasing services outside of the day program, because day programs are closed, make sure that the overall budget ceiling is being looked at. In other words, you want to make sure uh, your entire year services can be funded through the budget. So you wouldn't want to front load services right now, take the day program out, uh, burn a lot of funds on uh, uh, other services, and then when day programs open back up, not have money left in the budget to be able to return to the day program. Um, but uh, that information is out, and if your support coordinator is confused or needs some assistance, they can reach out to our support coordination unit, and we'd be more than happy to work them through it. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I know just from, from my experience, I think it's being handled um, reasonably well. My son is in a supervised apartment run by one agency. He's in a day program run by a different agency, and um, the residential agency has taken all their um, DSPs from their day programs and is serving people in the residential uh, programs. That seems to make more sense than expecting um, the day program to try to uh, reach people in so many different um, residential settings. Um, I would hope that um, you know they would focus on the individuals who are still living in their own homes. Uh, who probably um, have a greater need for um, some activities. Uh, I know where we are, um, the DSPs are trying to conduct uh, recreation and learning activities uh, in, in, in our residential settings. Um, but it, it, I, I mean, I, I'm sure it's always hard uh, for uh, providers who are used to having everybody in a congregate setting to uh, try to provide the same sort of services to people when they're so uh, broadly dispersed. Um, it's just a very trying situation for uh, everyone. And um, I, I, I just think we all have to uh, realize that families are having a very, very difficult uh, time. Um, they've got um, their work responsibilities, they've got their families, uh, not uh, able to get all the services uh, that they needed. Um, they're uh, staying in, trying to stay safe. Uh, very, very stressful time. And um, I'm really looking forward to the effort that uh, Jonathan was talking about to uh, plan for how uh, day services will be reintroduced. Um, I know I spoke to the people who run uh, my son's program and they're concerned that, uh, you know, they don't have enough space uh, to accommodate uh, all the participants in their programs with social distancing 
And then you wonder, well, what do we do? Do we have group A that comes every odd day, odd number day, and group B that comes every even number day? If you try to uh, give everybody half a day, the transportation costs and transportation time become overwhelming. It might make more sense to just alternate uh, days, but we really don't know um, when they'll open. So I, I just hope that uh, that Jonathan is talking about uh, we'll consider all the possibilities because um, when you don't know what the environment will look like, you really have to just do a lot of planning for whatever the eventuality uh, may be. So, uh, you know, again, thank you, Jonathan, for uh, coming up with that group and uh, taking an advanced look at what uh, the um, re-establishment uh, of day services will mean and how it will be um, conducted. Um, Paul, oops. I have yeah. Ryan Roy who wants to speak and then Sarah Aziz who wants oh, to what, speak. Wonderful. As you can probably tell, I've been stalling for time, hoping that more people would uh, raise their hands. Ryan. <laughs> Hi, hi everybody. Um, how are you all doing? Um, you probably might be, you know, being. I know you guys are not laid back in your comfort zone. I know you guys are busy working, and especially during this, uh, you know, unprecedented trying times that we're dealing with right now. But at least you know we're you know home, healthy, safe. You know we're alive. Praise and thank the Lord, and we're really trying to get ourselves through it. You know, I've been home since Friday, March 13th. You know, I would love to go to a lot of, you know, regular routines and, you know, responsibilities I need to exercise on. But, you know, health is really important. I got to be alive. I mean, I don't know if you guys heard. I got a new job. I got hired. That's through, um, you know, a health care called Genesis in Wedgwood. And even though my dad got, you know, you know intervened, you know, scared and worried, thinking that I would be to get myself exposed to the residents who are dealing with COVID. But at least, you know, I've been home, you know, for a quiet while. And then uh, I'm going to be going to start my new job next month. So wish me luck. And then, you know, navigating through the whole system with my four-year-old, especially that he's on Google Classroom. I mean, he's doing all right. You know, I try not to really expose so much with YouTube videos because too much screening time is, isn't that great. But when it comes to dance videos, I'll definitely do it. And I've been doing a lot of science things and you know, all these kind of stuff. I mean, my wife's been really making sure that, you know, he's really being in the lines when it comes to drawing and he's learning about math. And then and I usually, you know, play with him along the way and, you know, take him outside and him riding the bike. And you probably see him running around in the house, but you know, at least going to his attention, going for his needs that are necessary, and everything else that's all there. And especially for those people who are dealing with these kind of circumstances, I'm with you guys, especially in group homes, supervised apartments, you know, and even the centers for independent living, and you know, agencies, and especially you know, advocacy groups as well. I'm all with you. And just hang in there. We'll get through this. Make sure you always wash your hands when you go out. Or wear your face mask when you when you're socializing with people. Make sure you keep your distance at six feet. So, you know, kudos to all the things that the DD Council has been doing. I've been following up with the work, been paying attention a lot, and keep it up. I'm done. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and uh, congratulations on your new job. Uh, it's great, especially in times like this, to hear good news. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, uh, Sarah. Hi, it's good to see everybody. And uh, I was wondering what the status of my appointment is because uh, it was it, it was going to take a long time anyway under optimal circumstances, and now we're dealing with a pandemic, so I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, I don't know if Mercedes has any insight. I certainly do not. Um, I, I unfortunately I suspect this is not. Um, you know, the highest priority right now for, yeah. for the, for the legislature. Uh, I mean, obviously I am concerned. We all are concerned because of the large number of vacancies that we have, uh, on, on the council and that we really need people like you and Ryan, um, aboard. Uh, but I, you know, it, it, it it's very, very hard when, uh, the system is under such great stress to, you know, bring up, um, 
the, the, the subject with the DHS people or the, or the governor's office. Uh, I don't know if Mercedes has any um, further insight. Yeah, I thought it was like a low priority anyway under great circumstances, and now I feel like it's an even, you know, an even lower priority. So, uh, so uh, well, it's, okay. it's a bit easier when the legislature at least is in regular session. Yeah. So, Mercedes, what do you think about it? So, you know, I think that it would be uh, timely to recircle back, but the, you know, up until March. 18th, there was no communication. I, I have not in the last nine weeks reached out to the governor's office of appointments. So I'll, I will put it back on the radar and see if uh, we, I get any response. Um, as Paul said, it's probably not the top priority, but uh, at least to make sure they know we're still out there and you're hanging in there, Ryan, you're hanging in there, Annette, Kyle, um, thank you for joining us today. And um, Maybe we'll have some answers soon. Um, I hope. I hope so. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Miss Haiti. You're welcome. Uh, and one thing I can guarantee you, you will be you, far Tom. better prepared to become full uh, confirmed members of the council than virtually the rest of us were. <laughs> so, to Paul, uh, we have a um, Paul. Um, can I a moment? Can you, yeah. Uh, you, do you want to do that comment? Yeah, we have a comment on our YouTube, um, the Tom's River Committee on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities wanted to ask if the council has any guidance on how our their municipal county uh, committee can, their, I'm sorry, how their municipal committee can support residents during this time and if you, we require any assistance with any initiatives that we may be working on. So thank you to the Tom's River Committee for that comment. Um, can we also uh, refer to the regional council? So, yeah, I did forward. Um, we got this earlier in the, um, in the week uh, as well. And we, I did forward that to Kyoko and Rebecca. So we'll get, um, we'll connect you to the local council for family support planning and in your area and uh, any of the advocacy groups there as well. Okay. Um, I'm getting a note here that uh, Gary Rubin has a comment. Gary, you want to go? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, I've been working from home, of course. I'm making phone calls every day from, from um, you know, two hours, 12 to three. And I'm also doing advocacy groups, my advocacy groups, Helping Hands and the New American Movement, which I'm the co-founder of, me and the late Chick Chats founder. So I'm doing that as well on Tuesdays, every Tuesday. So I just wanted to let you know what I'm doing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we're about finished uh, with time. So unless someone has uh, a comment, I'm just going to wrap it up and thank everybody. Um, uh, this is Kevin Riz. One last comment. Uh, to those individuals who have been waiting to uh, officially join the council, it took me three years in normal circumstances. Has so, left the uh, meeting. Just um, so just please be patient, and it it takes time regardless. So just hang in there. But you, know, we we really do welcome your input and your suggestions thus far. Uh, yeah, I I, I would certainly uh, second uh, Kevin's uh, sentiments. Uh, try not to be discouraged. You will eventually become uh, full voting members. But you know you can participate with us. Um, until that time comes, so uh, don't give up. Uh, hang tight. Um, I also want to uh, last comment, just recognize the best background of all the people who are participating, and that goes hands down to Denny. Hmm. Uh, the greenest. Paul oh, Sophia has one more comment. Okay. Sophia. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I just wanted to, uh, well, first of all, I'm so glad that we have a council. Sophia, can you speak louder? You're very soft. Can you hear me now? I'm better. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just saying that I'm glad that we have an opportunity to do this virtual meeting and have uh, the public engage as well. Just a reminder for anyone who um, knows of special education students who are receiving free and reduced grab and go lunches. 
check in with the families, find out if they have access to the schools, try to get in touch with them, and um, get involved in any way that you can to ensure that the families are able to pick up the lunches. Uh, because that's just been an um, ongoing challenge for many families, being able to actually get to their schools and get the uh, the breakfast and the lunches. So I just wanted to make that point in the eleventh hour. Um, very worthwhile to point that out. Thank you, Sophia. Um, okay. Uh, again, thank everybody for coming at, to this meeting, and thank you for uh, your participation and. Um, Hopefully we will one day be able to meet again in person, but uh, if not, we'll do this again uh, on WebEx in August. And I, I, and I want to thank all the committees thank you. and subcommittees for their hard work, as well as our staff. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And enjoy the long holiday weekend. Be safe, everyone. Be safe. Be safe. Well, Have a happy Memorial Day. Bye. 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 Thank you, Bye. John. Elizabeth has left the meeting. Oh. Ellie Byra has left the meeting.